Well, it's good to be with you, and uh, <clears throat> we'll linger just a hair here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity again and, and the brethren inviting me to come to speak in this series of lectures. And uh, I'm always humbled by such an opportunity and to be associated with such a group of great minds. How's that? One more. I'll, I'll be looking down a lot. Okay, that's good. That's okay. Good. All right. So, uh, anyway, as I said, it's uh, it's always an honor to me to be to be associated with such a group of great minds, great thinkers, and I appreciate that. And uh, so we'll jump into this. And for those of you who don't uh, don't already know me. Uh, aside from being a troublemaker and a bully and the master of vitriol and venom, our Dems words, I flip houses for a living. We usually purchase one at auction, do a whole bunch of work on it. But during the last days of the project, we list it with a real estate agency. And bear with me because I'm still coming off of a headache, a busting headache this morning. So. Have patience with me. So the real estate agent shows the house to a number of people. Sometimes, sometimes it's the first one. Uh, <laughs> I've been fortunate with that a couple of times. Uh, but anyway, uh, a buyer will eventually make an offer. We negotiate on price. And we sign a contract. Typically, the buyer will provide a down payment as a surety of fulfilling all the terms of that contract. The contract will specify the closing date which will be the last day of the project. Now, several things must be fulfilled during the contract period because these are the days in which all things written in the contract shall be fulfilled, such as a buyer must procure proper financing. The contract also specifies that all things written regarding inspections must be completed prior to the last day, such as a termite inspection, a home inspection, and then there has to be a title search done, but the end is not yet because there has to be an appraisal made on the property to accommodate, uh, to make the bank comfortable with what they're loaning the money for. The closing agent then prepares the deed. The closing agent must prepare checks to disperse the funds to the seller, the real estate agent, and the unholy fees that the closing agency themselves charges. <laughs> then on the last day, real estate agents, the sellers, and the buyers meet at the closing agency. After both the seller and the buyer signs many, many documents, the seller hands over the keys. On this, the last day, the contract is consummated since all the terms written in the contract have now been fulfilled. So it's pretty easy to understand that during the contract period, the contract specifies a number of things that have to be done, have to be fulfilled, and as we go through the contract period, these things are being fulfilled one right after another, but it's not until the last day that all the terms have now been fulfilled. Now, would anyone question the fact that all the terms written in the contract had to be fulfilled by the last day? Since the specified terms were being fulfilled during the contract period, who would not understand that the entire contract remained valid till every last initial was signed? And who would argue that my saying on the last day, all things written in the contract would be fulfilled, means all inspections were not fulfilled until the day of closing? Or that if the all really means all things written in the contract, then all things written regarding inspections being fulfilled means the keys were handed over when all inspections were completed. Are we confused yet? <laughs> yet this is the exact type of static that we receive from the futurists when we point out to them the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 21 when he said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written 
may be fulfilled. And so because of what this passage says, eviscerates the futurist paradigm, then they have to go to work reconstructing the text so they can insert their own qualifier to modify the text. Because they say, well, if all things written means all, then when Jesus hanging on the cross said all things are now accomplished, then why that means you're arguing that the destruction of Jerusalem happened at the cross. Because after all, you know, Jesus said there in Luke 18 to his disciples, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written in the prophets be for, it's going to be accomplished. Even though Jesus qualified what he was saying there in that text. And you see, futurists ignore the qualified terms specified in this text. Yet because Jesus used a qualifier, and they do recognize that, but then they assume the prerogative to insert their own qualifier so that they can reconstruct Jesus' words. Now Jesus said there in Luke 18, to the twelve, behold, we go up to Jerusalem, all things written by the prophets, concerning the Son of Man should be accomplished. So he, he qualified what he was saying. And not only did he qualify it, he specified the things that were going to be fulfilled that was written by the prophets, all those things. He specified them. And then after his resurrection, he reminded them and said, now, this is what I told you back there. And you see, the, the, the very simple concept that people miss or ignore or elude is that Jesus didn't have to say, now, boys, all things are written about me, concerning me and the prophets is going to be fulfilled, except for A, B, and C. Because he specified the things that were going to be fulfilled in Luke 18. And you see, this passage right here, this text, until folks can understand this passage, all things written which, are, which will be fulfilled, these be the days of vengeance. All things written will be fulfilled. And he has what we Again, he repeats it right here. This generation. This generation. Not that one. This generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. And until we understand, until people understand that, I don't care what denominational background they have, until they understand that passage right there, their eschatology is going to be wrong. You cannot misunderstand this passage and have a correct eschatology. It just does not work. Now, this, Steve's already preached this one for me. We'll go through it. Uh, you know, I used to build houses. And the, the customer, the, the client, would select a piece of ground. We'd clear the property. Uh, materials would be brought in to work with, and we would lay the foundation. We start going up with the framing. The walls will start going up. Uh, we start up with the rafters, uh, the purlings, and you know, the, and then the roofing would go on, the siding, the ports, the doors, and the windows. But there would come this final day, the last day of the project, when every last detail was completed. Even right down to Mary Ellen spackling a nail hole under a shelf in a closet. Yes, we built that. Now, when the last days begin, that's what we're going to go into here in just a little bit. When the last days begin, then these prophecies began to be fulfilled. These terms of the contract, they began to be fulfilled. One right after another. <laughs> Things written in John the Baptist, well, those are fulfilled. And we'll even look at that a little bit later, too. Things written of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, those were fulfilled. Things written of the birth and church of the king, the birth of the church kingdom. Those are fulfilled. But see, not every detail has been fulfilled yet, even though these are being fulfilled one right after another. And again, the point of this is, in any other venue of life, people have no problem whatsoever comprehending this concept. It's only when the scriptures contradict their presupposition that this they have to fight against this. Things written of Gentile salvation, those are being fulfilled. But Jesus said these days, and when you compare that with Luke 17, he actually said the day of the Son of Man. But he said these will be the days that all things written will be fulfilled. 
But because there were things written of the resurrection and the, ju uh, and the judgment and of the second coming, then futurists have to use the hammer of eisegesis to drive the square peg of Scripture into the round hole of futures paradigm. Now, the prophet Joel foretold of the day of the Lord coming at the sound of the trumpet. He said this would be a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, and he said that of this day pertaining to this day, there has not ever been the like, neither shall there be any more after it. We find a day in Jeremiah 30 that is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. And that day, there would be none like it. Notice that. So that none is like it. Same idea. Likewise, Daniel predicted that there should be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Now look at here. I've got the same things over Latin. I could go back and highlight this. Look at this right here. And at that time, at what time? At this time of trouble. He said, there shall be a time of trouble. And then he said, and at that time, at the time of trouble, would be the opening of the book's judgment and the resurrection of the just and the unjust out of the dust. And you see, Jesus quoted that. He quotes that in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, he says, for then, and that's at the time of the abomination of desolation, then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now folks, you can't have, there cannot be more than one event that there is none other like it. Amen. You just can't do that. These prophecies are all pointing to the same event. Joel goes on, Describing this day of the Lord as a time that the earth will quake before them. The heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. His camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. He goes on to say, and it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, which Peter interprets on the day of Pentecost by saying it should come to pass in the last days. And then Joel finishes that uh, block of prophecy there. It, it's, there's actually, it doesn't stop because it goes right into chapter 3. It says, and in, those, in that day and in that time. So chapter 3 is connected. But he says the sun should be darkened, or excuse me, the sun should be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. So when Joel posits the day of the Lord at the sound of the trumpet, saying it is nigh, then when you read the context, then you see that that is posited in the last days. Now, Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that is going to pass in the last days. All right, Peter also said that Moses and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, that didn't leave any out of the desert, have likewise foretold of these days. Thus, all the prophets foretold of the last days. Now, look at what Israel says here. He calls his sons together. Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which should befall you in the last days. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And I had other things I wanted to tie into that, but I've run out of time to do it. I wanted to tie in Hebrews 1 and demonstrate that if, if the Lord has not returned, then the scepter has not departed from Judah. But I'll have to save that for another time. Now, Peter said, of Christ, he says, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Paul says of Christ that he has once, he appeared now, that's, that's Paul's now, once in the end of the ages he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now hang on to them. All right, Joel was a prophet. 
Joel foretold of the last days. All the prophets foretold of these days. Therefore, all the prophets foretold of the last days. All right? Paul says, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Jesus spoke to his apostles during his earthly ministry. Jesus' earthly ministry was prior to Pentecost. Therefore, the last days did not begin on Pentecost. Therefore, the last days cannot be referring to the Christian age. All right, again, he says, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. A little bit repetitious here. We'll make a point. Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry. Jesus was manifest in these last times, said Peter. When Jesus was manifested was during his earthly ministry. Therefore, the phrase, these last days, is synonymous with these last times. All right, again, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by Son. Jesus was fainteru, fainteruo, whatever, in these last times. And Paul said again of Christ, but now once at the end of the ages, he has fainteru to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Therefore, these phrases, the last days, these last days, these last times, and the end of the age are synonymous. Therefore, since Jesus was not manifested at the end of the Christian age, nor did he speak to his disciples at the end of the Christian age, nor was he crucified at the end of the Christian age, then the last days and these last times and the end of the age cannot refer to the end of the Christian age. All right, now, Josephus wrote that the Romans, quote, burnt down the treasury chambers in which was an immense quantity of money and an immense number of garments and other precious goods there reposited. And to speak all in a few words, there it was that the entire riches of the Jews were heaped, to, heaped up together while the rich people had there built themselves chambers to contain such furniture. Now watch what James says. Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Now watch. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Notice, you have heaped treasure together. Why? For the last days. Now folks, how unintelligent and disconnected from common sense would people have to be to heap together material riches in preparation of the end of material creation? I mean, think about that. This passage right here, by itself, refutes the entire future's paradigm. Amen. Because without an end of time, there is no future's paradigm. Now, the Israelites wanted gods which they could visually see. Futurists want a visible bodily resurrection, which they can see. Futurists want a visible bodily return of Christ, which they can see. Bruce Reeves wants a visible destruction of the universe, which he can see. Futurists are walking after the flesh and not after the spirit. Futurists are walking by sight and not by faith. Futurists are looking at the things which are seen, not at the things which are not seen. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. You see, it's a lack of faith. All right, so where is the doctrine of the end of time found in the Bible? If the end of time was predicted by Moses and the prophets, then since Moses and the prophets was fulfilled in the first century, then we wouldn't be here, would we? And you'd be surprised at how many people have a spasm and short circuit when they're confronted with the simplicity of that, that statement right there. That's right. Since Jesus came to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law and the prophets, and since uh, time didn't end in the first century, then by default, the end of time is not in the Old Testament. 
since Peter was reminding his audience of the words spoken before by the Holy Prophets, since the Holy Prophets did not predict the end of time, then Peter cannot be predicting the end of time. This is another one of those short-circuiting spasm type uh, reactions that we get when they come to grips with that fact right there. Since Peter said Paul wrote of these things in all his epistles, then Peter's day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night is Paul's day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. Since Paul's eschatology was taken solely from Moses and the prophets, and since Moses and the prophets did not predict the end of time, then Paul's eschatology does not contain any end of time doctrine. Amen. Since Jesus came to confirm the promises made to the fathers, since there were no promises of the end of time made to the fathers, then Jesus did not predict the end of time. In other words, the end of time is neither predicted nor confirmed in Scripture. Not only does the Bible know we're predicting the end of time, it actually says the opposite. You thought I wasn't going to get here, what, didn't you? <laughs> <clears throat> all right, we're going to read a little bit of Psalms 89, not all of it. You do that on your own time. Okay, it begins. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth. I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Drop down to verse 20. Jehovah says, I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate me. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my God, excuse me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. All right, now. We want to keep verses 3 and 4 in mind here as we proceed, which points out that Jehovah swore this covenant to David, of thy seed will I establish forever, and, conjunction there, build up thy throne to all generations. And let's recall that the angel told Mary that he should be great, should be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. All right, let's go on in Psalms. Psalms 89, my mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, and there's three more verses there of this if clause, that if, if the people are disobedient, yet Jehovah says, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It, his throne, shall be established forever as the moon and has the faithful witness in heaven. Now, we find an interesting text in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. And this is where uh, it's recorded that at the death of Jehoshaphat, his son Jehoram comes into reign in Israel. And he, he, he murders his, six, his five brothers. He kills many princes in Israel. He takes Ahab's daughter to wife. And he works much, much evil in Israel, and I think the text says that he even uh, uses the utensils in the temple, the holy place or whatever, in service to Baal. Watch what happens here. Watch what this says. Even though all this transpired, all this wickedness in Israel, the text says, 
how be it the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he made with David and as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. So this is a perfect demonstration of this if clause here where Jehovah says now, you know, if, if they're disobedient and they break my law, then I'm not going to break my covenant. I'm not going to break my oath to David. And that example proves it. All right, so, and you'd be, again, you'd be surprised at that, that in discussions with people to back them in the corner to where they can't answer it, and they can't even admit that it's impossible for God to lie. I've had that to happen. Literally, they would not admit that it's impossible for God to lie because it, the points made beforehand would refute them. All right, Jehovah swore to David that his seed would be established forever. Jehovah's sworn covenant with David cannot be broken. That sworn unbreakable covenant specified that Messiah would endure forever and his throne would endure forever as long as the days of heaven. And Messiah and his throne would endure as long as the sun and as the moon and so then we have the question, if time comes to an end, then what happens to the days of heaven? If material creation will be destroyed, then what happens to the sun and the moon and the stars? They'd cease to exist, right? So if that happens, then what happens to Messiah and his throne? Because God swore to David that Messiah and his throne would endure as long as the days of heaven, as the sun, and as the moon. And then the biggest question of all is what happens to God's oath? What is the purpose of the eternality of Messiah and his throne being juxtaposed to the continuity of the days of heaven and the sun and the moon if the days of heaven and the sun and the moon will cease. Okay, let's look at another text. Jeremiah 31. And this is where God said that he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I'm not going to read the whole passage. We're familiar with it. Especially since Paul quotes that in Hebrews chapter 8. And he says in the same new he has made the first old, and the thing being made old and growing, notice the present tense language, aged is near disappearing. So if it ended at the cross, how could it be in the process of being made old and growing aged and be near disappearing? But here's what I want you to notice. We continue on reading the, the, next, pen, the next words off the pen of the prophet. He says, Thus saith the Lord which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. It's impossible for God to lie, right? Okay, to set this in concrete, the next verse says, Thus saith the Lord. If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel. So again, he sets this in concrete by two things, two facts that you can't measure the heavens and you can't search out the foundations of the earth. All right, again, Jeremiah 33, one more. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying, verse 19, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. And again, to set that in concrete, he says, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measure, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. Now, you see what he's doing here? He is, he is saying the same thing different ways. 
Just like when Jesus said, if any man come to me and he hate not his father, mother, brother, sister, so forth, his family members, then he can't be my disciple. Well, if that was the only place where we had that, that that, that was referenced, that, that would sound like he's teaching that we have to hate our family. But you see, he also said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So you see, he's teaching the concept that we must love him more than anything or anybody else. He's teaching the same thing different ways. That's what these prophecies are pointing to. They're saying the same thing in different ways. Now, can the vastness of the heavens be measured? No, that's impossible. Can the foundations of the earth be discovered? No. Then the seed of Israel cannot be cast off. Can the stars of heaven be counted? No. Can the sand of the seashore be measured? No. Then the seed of David cannot be numbered, especially since there's no end. <clears throat> Can the seed of Israel ever cease from being a nation before God? No. It's impossible. Then the ordinances of the sun, moon, and stars cannot depart from before God. <clears throat> Can God's sworn covenant with David be broken? No. Then God's covenant of day and night will never cease. Can God lie? No, that's impossible. Then Messiah and his throne will endure as long as the days of heaven, since his covenant with day and night cannot cease. And Messiah and his throne will endure as long as the sun, moon, and stars, since those ordinances cannot depart from before God. Why? Because God swore to David that of thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. The verse already been covered. Solomon said one generation passes away and another comes, but the earth abides how long? Forever. And Paul said, to him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, unto all generations, world without end. Now, what is the result and the reactions that we receive when we make this kind of exegesis what 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 are the what are some of the reactions we receive from futurists things like this text does not deny that a spiritual nation can be tied to mortal time and continue on into immortality we're just going to slide right into eternity at the end of time <laughs> Psalm, Psalms 89 points to Jesus being forever established to all, to all generations. Now notice, but that could mean all generations that God allows. God doesn't count time as man does. God's time is not man's time. Jeremiah 33 is not saying God can't end the covenant promise of day and night, but the man could not end it. <laughs> Notice Jeremiah 19, Jeremiah 33, 19 through 22, very spe specifically says the time frame is, quote, their season. This qualifies the time frame and all seasons end. At hand with the Lord is as far off and far off as at hand. And I promise with my hand up, pun intended, that I did not make that up. That is a literal, actual quote. All right. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. The thousand years is a day, and day is a thousand years state. See, futurists, they rip this out of the context of Peter reminding his audience of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And again, remember he said that all the prophets from Samuel, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of the last days. And I still have not figured out why that banner acts like I do when I get up every morning. All right. So who was Peter's audience? 
Peter says that he was writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Brother John Welch, pay attention. Peter says he was writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims of dispersion, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Now, we find a, a, another interesting statement, and this is where Jesus told the Jews that I'm going away, and where I go, you can't find me, or you can't follow me. And the Jews said among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? You see, I don't think the Jews would be saying, is Jesus going to go to the Gentiles, dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? Okay. And then James very clearly says that he is writing to the 12 tribes which are of the dispersion. So this is Peter's audience as well as James. So then what is the framework from within which we must interpret this verse, this statement of a thousand years is as a day and a day as a thousand years. Well, it has to be within the framework of Peter reminding his Hebrew audience of what the Hebrew prophets foretold. And all the prophets foretold of the last days, which is synonymous with the end of the Jewish age, as we have already demonstrated. Now, as Peter applied Joel's prophecy on Pentecost Day to the last days, and since Peter's predictions in 2 Peter 3 apply to the last days, then Peter is applying Psalms 90 to the last days of the old covenant age of Moses and the law. Again, contextually, that's inescapable. Now, here are some things that Peter never said. These are futurist teardrops, by the way. God doesn't understand time in man's world. No, well, Peter never said that. God is incapable of clearly communicating time to man. Peter never said God deliberately communicates time statements confusedly to man, you know, keep him on his toes, keep him scared all the time, etc. He never said that. And he never said that God's time statements can be elasticized to infinity and beyond. But now here are some things Peter did say. He said, writing to the diaspora, their salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. Their present persecution, which he goes on to define as the fiery trial taking place among them, notice the present tense language, and he tells them don't be astounded or astonished as if something strange were happening to you, present tense. And as a side note, we'll notice that John, writing to some of these same people, churches of Asia, told them that this hour of trial was about to come on them. So if it was taking place when Peter wrote, then that dates the writing of Revelation prior to Peter's epistle, doesn't it? But he says that their present persecution Notice the present tense language is bringing them to the goal of their faith, that is, the salvation of their souls. And he said, being sober, hope perfectly upon the grace that is being brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, why would Peter say that? Why would he say that this grace is being brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ? Well, it's probably because that's what Jesus taught him. In specific response to the question of when the kingdom would come in Luke 17. 
And Jesus used the analogy of Noah and the flood and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, Peter uses the exact pattern, the same analogies in chapter 2 to set up the pattern for what he's going to say in chapter 3. And Jesus said, even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, which is parallel, again, with the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus, again, uses the analogy of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, as those were, so also will the parousia of the Son of Man be, which demonstrates that the parousia of the Son of Man and the revelation of Jesus Christ is synonymous. Peter said God is ready to judge the living and the dead. Peter said the end of all things is at hand. He said the time, that's kairos, the set or appointed time, has come for the judgment to begin. And he said Christ's glory is about to be revealed. He said, there will be false teachers among you who will deny the Lord that bought them as even futurist commentators admit that Peter is alluding to the Song of Moses. Which was written to all Israel, taught to the children of Israel. And he says, this is going to tell you about the evil which will befall you in the latter days. And he wished that they would consider their end, their latter end. He says, for whom the judgment of long ago does not linger. Again, notice the present tense language. And their destruction is not slumbering. Again, as he alludes to the Song of Moses. He says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming, the, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his parousia? Or since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So where is the promise of his coming? And he said, for this they willingly are, present tense, ignorant of. Now, Malachi, he foretold of the coming of Elijah before the, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he would come as the Lord's messenger. And of course, Jesus confirmed that that prophecy was fulfilled in, the, in the, the work of John the Baptizer. But I want us to notice that the messenger would come and proclaim of Jehovah, I will come near to you to judgment. So who is the contextual you? Well, whoever it is, they were told to remember the law of Moses and they were called all Israel. And he says, Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. Now when John came and preached, we see in Matthew 3 that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his immersion. He said to them, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath about to come. And he said, even now. When? Now. When is that? That's John's now. Even now the axe lies at the root of the tree. Notice the present tense language. And every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and done what? Cast into the fire. And he said, the one coming after me shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire, whose fan is, not shall be, is in his hand. And he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the garner, 
but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. All right again, in Isaiah 40, we have another prophecy of the coming of John the Baptist as the voice. And he says that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. O Zion that bring us good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain. O Jerusalem that, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Notice, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him, but his reward is with him and his work before him. But now watch this. The voice said cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Notice that. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And what did Peter say? For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And what did James say to the same audience? But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now why did Peter apply this prophecy, Psalms 90 verse 4, to the last days? Well, he was reminding them of what he had said in his first letter as well as the words spoken before by the holy prophets. And he says that the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved in the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Again, as he is alluding to the song of Moses. Then he says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So again, he is quoting from Psalms 90 and verse 4, which says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past. When it is past. Notice that. And as a watch in the night. And you see, it might, it might help us to better understand the context of this psalm, or at least it does me, when we look at verse 1, where it says a prayer of Moses. And this is where the eternality of God is pointed out. From everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. But now watch this. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest return, ye children of men. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. Anybody see the analogy of Noah here? They are as asleep. Now notice, in the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourishes, it grows up, and in the evening it is cut down and withers. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. For we are consumed by thine anger. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, and our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale of that is told. So you see, when we look at these, all these texts, this is judgment language. And this is judgment language pointing to the end of Old Covenant Israel in their last days. And this is what the scoffers are scoffing about, the day of the Lord. Where is it? Where is the promise 
of his parousia. And Peter tells them that the Lord is not slow concerning his promise because of the eternality of God. A thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years when it is past. And then he goes right on and says, seeing then that all these things are being dissolved. Verse 11. Present tense. And I've had the, the pleasure of seeing some others get into a spasm with that verse right there. And I made a video about it. You come to verse 10 and you want to jump to verse 11. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's what I was accused of. Jumping to verse 11, the next verse. And Peter said that the glory is about to be revealed. Now folks, we have two options here. The first is, Peter is predicting the end of material creation, which means that God's sworn covenant with David can and will eventually be broken, meaning that God can in fact lie. Or option B, Peter is not predicting the end of material creation, which means that God's sworn covenant with David will endure as long as the sun, moon, and stars, as long as the day and night, world without end. 